All right, we're on time. So good morning, everyone. Today, we will continue talking about what is this non-contextual models, and we'll try to look into a bit more detail what's happening in there, in particular when we concatenate operations. And then this will allow us to prove that logical principal selection paradoxes are a proof of quantum contextuality. And then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit more about why we, why we should care about this thing. Okay, so let me just recap. So what was this idea of measurement, uh, measurement non-contextuality? So this was the idea that, or maybe we have some description of a preparation. For example, it could be a quantum state, okay? But that what's really going on is that this uh, you know, when we think we prepare a quantum state, it's like preparing a gas at a certain temperature and pressure. What's really going on is that inside uh, there are some real states, these ontic states, and all that's happening here is that uh, this corresponds to a distribution over the set of ontic states, right? So, where if I, if I put here all my ontic states on a line, then preparing different states this corresponds to preparing different, um, I don't know, distributions here, okay? And that then, well, we have some measurement statistics which are experimental, and in this case are also given by our quantum model, by the Born rule, statistics. And that's like if we have the quantum description is some POVM element, and that's at the level of the ONTIC model, what this does is to define some distribution on the ontic state such that you know this is a this probability distribution must sum up to one for all the outcomes of a given measurement and it's related to my quantum theory so my kind of the macroscopic model. <laughs> like this, right? So we have the quantum probabilities of getting the outcome EK, given that I have state rho, and I prepared, and I made this measurement, is given by this, and this is given by just a, a statistical model in my ontic state. So the, that distribution there, Okay. okay. And we will later see how to derive this thing from basic principles either today or tomorrow. But for now, we just take this for granted. And the spirit is that the, these probabilities don't depend on which measurement was done. They just depend, like in the, like in the quantum case, they just depend on the P of M element, right? So in the quantum case, when you're talking about the probability for a quantum state, they only depend on the POVM element. And now what we're saying is that also for the real states underneath, for the ontic states, they also only depend on the POVM element. Okay? And then we saw two examples of if, if I can write this, the POVM element as some, uh, some mixture or some sum or some combination of other POVM elements, then the probabilities are linear. Okay. 
and we saw this for the case where the, this pj is, is larger than zero. Right, so we saw it for the case where I have a global measurement and I'm just coarse graining it. And also for the case where my, my measurement is given by a probabilistic mixture of two measurements, right? And the way to prove this is to find, you know, at the operational level, find some procedure such that this is true, okay? Like this flipping a coin and then choosing which measurement to take. And then the probabilities, the quantum probabilities are given by this. And then because the, quant the ontic probabilities only depend on the P of M element, this is true for any measurement that has this as an element. So I will make a picture that will be a bit useful also later in the day. So suppose that this is a set of all, this is a set of all ontic states, right? Like here, we put it on a line, and there we put it into D because it will be easier to visualize. Okay. And then for every state that we prepare, there's like the support of this distribution, right? This is, I call it omega corresponding to this. So this is just all the ontic states for which um, uh, this measure is non-zero, okay? which depends on which state I prepare, right? If I prepare a state that's orthogonal to this, then um, will be a different distribution. Okay, so I'll, I'll draw it here and then I'll define it. So say this is my garo, and the definition is, well, please, this is abuse of notation. By this I mean it's like the smallest subset uh, of did I use here? Yeah. So the smallest subset of lambda, well, in the smallest element of sigma of lambda such that it has measure one. Okay. So the idea being that everywhere else it's zero. So I'm just taking this thing. Okay. And now when I make a measurement, now, if this thing and this thing will be zero for some ontic states and non-zero for other ontic states as well. So I can again define the set of uh, of ontic states for which this is non-zero. Right, so what's this? Okay. This is all the lambdas such that this probability is not zero, right? So when I say I prepare a quantum state and I make a measurement and I do this outcome, what does this mean in our model? It means that, you know, when I prepare the state, I prepared one of these lambdas uh, at random according to that distribution, but I know it must be inside this green set, okay? And when I then later measured it for the probability to be non-zero, then this lambda must be in this, in this red set, right? Otherwise, the probability would be zero. So if it was here, the probability would be zero. So when I, uh, if I prepare the state rho and I obtain an uh, outcome k, then I know that my lambda must have been in this intersection between the two. Right, the actual state that was actually prepared in my model. Okay, so so if I prepare a row and I measure get outcome k, then I know that lambda, the actual lambda that was prepared, must have been. So in particular, well, let me just write. 
again, the probability, sorry, in, so in particular the trace, this probability of EK rho is the sum over all things, over all states of this thing, E mu rho of lambda PR. EK give a lambda. But you know, if one of these is zero, then the thing is going to be zero, so we may as well just do the overlap here. So just do this integral in this smaller set that we overlap. Okay? So in particular, if we have, if we prepare a state and then measure another state, so if you have a successful pre and post selection, right? So if If this is larger than zero, then it must be it must mean that uh, this overlap there is non-zero. Okay, so this means that the state preparation, and then this corresponds to this projector into the final state. So this cannot be zero. Okay. So that's, that's the spirit of a non-contextual model, right? Is when we prepare a quantum state, we're going to prepare one of these green things at random. If we measure it, well, then it must also have been in this, in this red area. Okay. But if you want to apply this kind of theory to this logical pre and selection paradoxes, then there are several things happening, right? We prepare, we measure once, and we measure again. So let's look at what happens when we start concatenating quantum operations. And first, we look at the simplest case. Please interrupt me if you have any questions. Yeah. One, I have no idea what you're. It's interesting, sorry, yeah. <laughs> this is an omega. <laughs> so this is an omega. This is the green set. This is an intersection. And this is a lambda. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, so now let's look at what happens if we do the following. So we, we prepare a quantum state. Rho. Then, you know, in our quantum description, we apply some unitary U. And then we measure some P of M. Okay. So what's happening in our model? Well, first we, we prepare the row, right? And this with some uh, the row corresponds to a distribution to a measure on the ontic state. So this created some state uh, lambda at lambda that we don't know. Then we applied an operation, and an operation in particular could be. I mean, we don't know anything about the dynamics of this uh, of this ontic space, so it could be any operation that maps states to each other. Okay, so I'll just call it here. Uh, this is not the same sigma as the sigma algebra, it's just some operation on ontic states that depends on the unitary u, okay? Which will map this state to another state. I don't know. Then we applied our measurement. Uh, and then we get this probability of EK, given the state, and the state was just this. This thing, we know nothing about this, right? OK. And what's the quantum rule? Well, we know that trace of EK. What's the state? The state is the unitary applied to Rho, well, this must be this integral 
50 euro uh, lambda. And now this probability that we saw there. Ek given whatever happened to our own tick state. Okay, so call this option A. Another way to look at it is to say, well, uh, we prepared directly. What we prepared directly was not A. We prepared it like directly this state. This is a valid quantum state, so it corresponds to some distribution, to some measure on the ontic states directly. And what this allows us to do is to get rid of this thing that we don't know, this mysterious operation, right? Uh, let's put here on the prime. And from here again, we compute, we apply uh, this, this measurement. Okay. So now in this option B, what we have is the probability of EK given this lambda prime. Let's write here B. So here, this corresponds to what? You now with a new measure corresponding to the new state that I prepared, I write here lambda prime for to distinguish it from before. Okay, okay so this. Uh, I mean, th this is fine. It would probably, for most cases, be easier to work with than the previous one, because we just need to know how this measure works, not how the inner operation works. But because quantum mechanics is very nice to work with, we have a, an even easier option, which is to say, well, this trace, the trace is cyclic, so we can put, we can bring the unitary to this side, and now this this thing here is a new p of m element right so this fk is a valid p of m element okay. so what this would mean would be the following if we look at this model then we say well we prepare the same initial state but now we just do another measurement right it's like saying you know, if I have some state, for example, if I have some state phi, and then I do a measurement in the x basis, this is the same as applying some operation and then doing a measurement in the z basis, right? So in the first option, we were looking at this picture, and now we're just looking at this picture. So we, we put this unitary inside the the measurement description. Okay. So in this case, what are we doing? We're saying, well, we start from rho. We use the same distribution to get our state. And now we simply, we make another measurement. Okay, we make this measurement uh, fk. And then we get what here? We get this probabilities of fk given state lambda. So if I bring this here, it's the last time I'll write in red. Uh, then this is again here. Probability of u dagger. EK, U, and lambda. <laughs> this is option C. All these things are the same. Uh, some of them will be easier to work on than others, depending on, on our setting. So if we look in pictures, If you look at this picture, what we're doing, for example, in the green case, the second option, 
is to rotate this set, right? We're rotating the, this distribution. What we're doing in the, in the other case is to rotate this set here, okay? To modify this set of the corresponding to the outcomes. The overlap must be the same, obviously, right? In both cases, right? Because if, um, yeah, lambda must always become belong to the overlap between the two things. So now, let's make it harder. Can I raise here? So now we apply uh, TPCPM and any, any map. Right, so it's not necessarily a unitary. Okay, so let's look at the black line. This will be the same. We prepared the state. Now apply some operation that depends on the on the map, and we do this measurement. Okay. No difference whether it is unitary or not. So here. The quantum probabilities is we have the state, we applied some map, and now we apply the EK. Okay. And here it's the same except to put here my map, right? Uh, same thing for the green. I can just say, well, instead of preparing rule, I prepare here this. Everything goes through. Nothing about it being unitary or not. The only complication goes when we, we want to go through the red line. So now we say, well, in the quantum description, I don't want to change the state, but I want to like gobble up this operation in the description of the measurement. Okay. Now, I don't know if you looked into this in detail, in, but we'll go through the definition. Um, in quantum information theory, but this is done by what's called the adjoint of the channel. Okay, we will now define the adjoint of the channel. It's essentially, like this is the definition of the adjoint of the, of the channel. So, if this is true, if we can find such a channel that that's true, then here we just need to put that thing. And now we say the same thing. This is the P of M element. And just change here. So we're going to keep this. And now let's, let's define this joint. So suppose we have a map, and let's just do the general case. Uh, so it goes from operators on some, this is endomorphisms on some Hilbert space to operators in another. In that case, it's always the same space, but more generally it could be like this, and let's say it's a TPCPM. Okay. Then the adjoint, it's gonna be the map that goes the other way around. from B to A, such that exactly that condition, right? So I'll put here any arbitrary operator doesn't need to be a density matrix. Could, could 
be any operator. So it's just for any operator applied on row A, what's the equivalent operator that I could apply on, on B, uh, such that you know, the measurement statistics would be preserved. Okay. And there is one. Uh, so this thing exists, and I think we'll do some exercises uh, in the tutorial about this. But let me just give you some properties. Well, the only property is that we carry that is linear. This will be very useful later. So in particular, if I can decompose the original channel uh, with this being real numbers for now, for easy, then Things work nicely, meaning that the adjoint is just a combination, the linear combination of the adjoint of the individual maps, and that we can do this directly from that condition. So if you look at, well, what's the trace of sigma b rho a? So now we expand this. Right. The trace is linear, so and now we apply the condition again inside here. So we get oh, some of I of we apply the condition just inside here, so we have the adjoint of the individual channel. So A. And now we just put it inside a trace again. Over I, over I. It's just using linearity of trace twice. Okay. Uh, why will this be useful? I'll erase here. So if, if this TPCPM that we do in the middle can be written as uh, bro, Bj of rho, then we know that, sorry, Pr is the ontic probability. of uh, given semantic state is just going to be the probability of that thing. J, uh, J dagger, PK, 
give a lambda. And this, because of this condition we saw at the very beginning of, of non-contextual models, which I, Uh, why is this? Bec because we can think of, oh, this thing I'm doing in the middle, I can think of it as uh, I pick a number at random according to this distribution, and depending on the outcome j, uh, I, I perform this tunnel. Right? So then we know uh, that the probabilities need to satisfy linearity at the experimental level, and therefore we apply it here. This is going to be very useful when we start talking now about doing intermediate measurements. So now, we take a special case here, which is now a special case of a map, could be to do a projective measurement. And then we will measure again this P of M. Okay. Now, this is a special case of what we saw before. If we ignore the outcome of this measurement, because, so, so if I say I measure this, but I don't record the results, or someone else is measuring, I know that they measure, but I don't know the outcome. Uh, I right, so if I don't look at the outcome, what is the map that corresponds to this? It's just that, right? This is. I mean, this is kind of the von Neumann update rate rule um, of what happens to the state after a measurement. Okay. And we may wonder, like in that picture, what is happening? We saw that these intermediate operations kind of rotate the sets, and one can ask, like, you know, for unitary operations, they don't change the overlap. But for a general map, they could, right? So for example, I could have the map that just erases the state, replaces it with zero, so this completely changes um, uh, the overlap. So, but for this, when the intermediate, um, when the intermediate operation is a projective measurement, that's a special type of map, and we'll see that uh, it still preserves this, this overlap between the two. And this will allow us later to talk about this pre and post selection with an intermediate thing uh, visually in a very easy way. Okay. So we will prove this. What time is it? Oh, good. So you will do in the tutorial the proof that if I have a projective measurement, um, then I can also write it like this. <laughs> where I'll explain what this, this is another uh, map, and this Q is a real number larger than zero. But, I mean, think about it, like, if I knew the initial state, and now all I know is that the projective measurement was made, it just increases the uncertainty about the state, right? It just makes it more mixed. This is what you'll do, you'll prove this in the tutorial. So you can always think of a projective measurement with this update rule as like, with some probability it preserves the state, that's one of the state, and with some probability it changes it to something else. Okay. Um, okay, but this is very useful because now we're gonna use uh, the thing we saw before. So what's, if we use this, then what's the probability now 
of getting a given outcome after applying. I know that there was a projective measurement. I don't know what it was. You know, I do a final measurement. What's the probability of getting the outcome k? Well, I'll just use this linearity. Uh, I use that linearity there. And I say, well, this is q. Rho is the same as saying, you know, it's the identity channel applied to rho. The adjoint of the identity is the identity. So it's q times the adjoint of the identity, which is the identity rho. Uh, sorry. PR applied to. I'll just even just write here identity k. On my ontic state, plus 1 minus q. And now I have to consider here the adjoint of this thing. OK. But now, by definition, so if this is a, a positive map, the adjoint is also going to be a positive map. According to my non-contextual model, then this thing here this is a probability, so it must be larger or equal than zero. According to this result here, uh, this is larger than zero, and this thing here is larger or equal than zero. So overall, I can just say, well, this whole thing is larger than Q, probability of EK. So, In particular, suppose that originally the, the overlap between these two sets was non-zero, so this probability was non-zero. Okay, so if if the probability of EK, so without intermediate measurement, this was positive, then you know this must be larger than something positive times something positive, so this will be larger than zero. Okay, so then okay. So which means that you know if I was originally in this overlap, then after doing this intermediate measurement, um, I'm still in the overlap between the two relevant sets. Okay, so how do I write this? If lambda belong to the overlap of row union, no, uh, intersection with this, then it also belongs to the preparation corresponding to doing this intermediate measurement and And what this tells us that like if what I'm doing here, if all I'm doing here is like an intermediate measurement, uh, then essentially uh, I'm just going to a larger set that contains the other thing. Uh, and that's because now, you see, you can do this now for any final measurement, right? So for any final measurement, oh, this overlap must be contained uh, in the overlap between black and red. So if you do this for all, you know, for all red measurements that kind of cover the green set, then you reach the conclusion that the, the black set must contain the green set. Okay. So. Now, there are some subtleties here because we talk about because we want this to apply to uh, continuous state, and, and it, you know this is for all for all lambdas that can be detected somehow. But we'll yeah, this is more of the intuition. But for now, uh, 
yeah, you can think about this mathematically. It's a bit dodgier. Okay. So now, what did we learn? So, in particular, if there was like pre and post selection was possible, then doing this intermediate measurement does not make it impossible. Okay, it's still possible, and this will be useful later on. Okay. So now ah, we can start already. What are we interested in? Well, we want to know all these probabilities. Right. We want to know what's the probability of getting some outcome k or j when I do the projective measurement, and we want to know what the probability of successful post-selection and all the conditionals and marginals and so on. Yeah. Okay. So. We do this just like we did in the in the quantum case. By defining a global measurement that really corresponds to measuring one and then the other. So the P of M elements are going to be uh, J K J K F J K. It's just yeah. okay. So we start with the joint probability. So this is just the probability that I got uh, outcomes j in the projective measurement and k at the end. FKJ rho. And this is just what we saw up there, right? Took table of rho. What's the marginal probability of a successful post selection? So, uh, Probability of post selection. By post selection, I mean that we get outcome k. Uh, well, there's many ways to compute it, but one of them is just saying uh, given this map, right? And this we saw. We computed it before, and this is just uh, trace of e k rho. But this this is just the sum of of these elements. So this gives me. Lambda of uh, Lambda sum over J Right. Just because this is the sum of J of PJ, PK, PJ, uh, JK. <laughs> okay, so now we have the Joint probability is the probability of the post selection, and what we're missing is this this AVL probability, right? The intermediate probability. Yeah. We can do it after the break, so I'll give you five minutes. So let's continue.
First, let me just make a bit more formal what this means. Uh, I said that, well, for all ontic states that matter, uh, this largest set, the black set, contains the green set. Uh, what this means, a way to formalize this mathematically is just saying that, well, if you want to measure the size of the black set according to the, to the measure of the original state, so this thing, this is measure one, right? So, you know, maybe some, yeah, that's it. Maybe there's some countably many lambdas that are not there, but it, it still is measure one. This is what will be relevant in a bit. So now, okay, what's missing to compute for our ABL probabilities is the conditional probability of getting outcome J given my post-selection row and the post-selection EK, right? Later, we look at pure states, both for this and this. But now we're still in the general case. So what's the probability of PJ given EK in row? This is just the probability of both of them happening, right? which is this, this global measurement given row divided by the probability of uh, just the final one happening, right? And we just computed both of them, right? So we have the integral over all lambda of du of lambda probability of Fjk given lambda. Divided by this, lambda, u of lambda, and now the sum over j. Fjk. Right. Now, We're doing these integrals over all of lambda, but this thing, this measure here is going to be zero outside my, my green set, outside my omega set, right? So we may as well just replace this here with the what is her, okay? And I mean, uh, well, Yeah, this is true. But we can even go to the larger set. So let's go to the larger set for now. That depends on the on what intermediate measurement you did. Right? We can do it equivalent because we know that this set has measure one. So outside the set is zero. So we did like this. Okay. Good. So now we will want to know what happens in particular when these two are pure states, right? Because that's our setting of our paradoxes. For this, we'll introduce a new assumption, which now will look like a very big assumption, but later we'll see how we can derive it from another type of non-contextuality. Okay. And that's the assumption of outcome determinism. So that's the general case. And now we have new assumption. And what's this? This is the saying that if uh, PJ, okay, if this is a projective measurement, then uh, PK 
I'm not. This can only be zero or one. So first, we, it looks like a very strong assumption. We'll see later how to, um, how to derive this. But what this means is the following. Like, it's like for projective measurements, which are like the purest kind of measurements in quantum theory that allow us to perfectly distinguish pure states, for example, uh, all the uncertainty is shuffled into this green set. Right? All the non-trivial probabilities are encoded just in this measure, in this measure uh, mu that corresponds to the preparation. Right? This gives us a distribution of the lambda, and then to know the probability of, the, of a given outcome, we just need to know if this lambda is inside the red set or not. If it's inside the red set, you're going to get one. If it's outside, it's zero. Okay. Okay, so it looks like a very strong assumption. For ontic, for ontic states and protective measurements, all the probabilities are zero or one. We'll see later, maybe today, if we have time, how to derive this from simpler principles. But for now, we're going to use it. Uh, Right here. So now we, we're going to look at the same setting as before, but in our logical PPS paradoxes. What did we have? Well, our initial state is some pure state. Uh, the post-selection that we're interested in is just this phi state, right? We can say, well, this is our E0, and E1 is 1 minus this. Okay. And we have these intermediate measurements. Right? We have this intermediate measurement, uh, M, intermediate measurement, which is just a binary projective measurement. And we're in this, uh, sorry, we're in this restricted set of things where these probabilities must all be one. So the quantum probability of P given this post-selection and this pre-selection is one, okay? And the other thing which you'll prove in the tutorial uh, is that this set, so these two states, in order to have a, a paradox, they must overlap. So, in, yeah. It must be strictly larger than zero, which means like we saw before that, um, Without the intermediate measurement, those two, the green set and the red set overlaps. Overlap, okay? Okay. So this probability is one, which is this thing here is one, right? So one as a probability of this P given Can, I will not write brackets all the time, but okay. So one is equal to that thing, which means that what's on top equals what's on at the bottom. So we have that chook. Uh, I'll index this by P. You know what it means? It's the black set corresponding to doing this intermediate measurement. So it could be. I'll just write what it is. Okay. And this is P rho P plus one minus P rho one minus P. It's the black set. Okay. So we have here 
Do you my probabilities? Uh, e mm. F. I'll I'll define this thing in a second. Equals what's on the right. And now if you're F uh P uh -huh. of F dot P well you know. Okay. Where this is just defining what's the global measurement, so F this is P. Just like I did there, right? So F P bar is one minus P one minus P and so on. Then I can also have the other two options where instead of uh, this projector into the post selection I have the complementary. Okay. So I have this equality. Uh, let's just break this integral into two. And this is going to be a long way around to prove something very simple. Okay, let's simplify this. Uh, there's a P bar here. So this is the same as that, so I cut. So we have zero equals this integral here, okay? This thing is positive, is larger or equal than zero. It could be zero for some elements because we are in the, we are in the black set, not in the green set. Um, but for this whole thing to be zero, it means that whenever of some small set that is contained here, whenever this is different than zero, then uh, then this integral must be zero, then this thing must be zero on the inside, okay, for states inside there. What I can just do here. Fine. Okay. Right, look, so this is positive. This is positive for the whole thing to be zero. It means that one of them must be zero at least, right? So Whenever this is not zero, this is zero. Okay? So this means that now we have huh. we're in this set, right? So maybe there's some points here where they're both um, sorry, we're we're still inside the red set, so this is uh, non-zero, but in this point, the green measure must be zero. That's <laughs> Let me write it mathematically, which is a bit more obvious. It means that this probability of f given lambda equals zero for all lambda uh, that are in a set p prime Okay, such that the measure of this set is here for the original state. Okay. 
And look, if we're looking at a discrete ontic space, this would all be much easier, and we just need to have this subtleties when, uh, when we're in continuous cases. So for all practical purposes, we can think of this thing here as being zero in a set that is defined appropriately enough. So what should I raise now? Questions? No. Why are we doing this? Because now, okay, we have this equality at the level of the integrals, but now if I say, well, if I restrict myself to a set, to an appropriate set, then I can have the equality at the level of the individual elements. So then I say for all lambda that belong to this special set, that has measure one. Yeah. The measure is, n oh, sorry, this should be a one there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. This should be a one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for all the lambdas inside this set, and now let's always work inside this set, uh, well, we have that uh, probability. Uh, I think of, look, I will confuse the order of this too, but P means intermediate measurement, you know this. is just this probability of e the same thing again, and then I can add zero. So add this thing here. Uh, right, I decided that thing for free because it's zero. But this, by linearity, because we're in a non-contextual model, this is the probability of E. Took. And this, this thing here is just like we saw before, right? It's just, it coarse grains to the final measurement and the probability of getting uh, our correct post selection in this case, right? Um, good. On the other hand, I'm still inside the. So now suppose that I'm. Let's say I'm still inside a set. So now I'm going to look just as the probability of P given lambda for any lambda for now. So forget about the post-selection, just for any lambda. And we saw that this P can be given by the sum of two by course graining this global measurement. Right? So in particular, if I write here the other one, sorry. There's still one missing, but if I write here this, this P, Identity minus projector. And if I sum this two, I get P, right? So this is uh, the probability of the sum of these two projectors. E. Lambda. But that's just the probability of even lambda plus uh, even lambda. Okay. But now let's say. 
Now let's say that I'm considering only lambdas that are inside the overlap between my set. Oh, sorry, this should be an omega. The set that I considered and the red set. So now I'm here, okay? I'm here and yeah, it's particular. I'm here or here. Okay, so I'm inside here. So I know that, look, this is a projector, so this probability can only be zero or one. And because I'm in this overlap, it's gotta be one. Okay. And this, well, in principle, it could be anything, but it's a probability, so it's larger than zero. And that's just by assumption, right? Because for any state that's inside here, um, sorry, P and P. Okay. There's something missing here. I'll get back to you later. Yeah, exactly. Because this was one. This was one. If if lambda belongs there, this is just the the, the probability of a successful post selection, right? And if we are inside this set, this is one. And this is the same as that. So we put this one here. Good. So now we have that the probability of p given lambdas for all lambdas inside this set, and that's kind of this set here. Yeah. Um, this probability is one. Good. Now, we have several of these project intermediate projective measurements, right? We can have many of these. So we can do this for every intermediate projective measurement. So for each of them, we'll, we'll get a different black set. And then we just take the intersection of all these black sets, okay? Each of these black sets has measure one, so the intersection also has measure one, okay? So now, what did we do? We take Take lambda belonging to this thing, uh, intersection with the red one, where this is just intersection of overall P's that have probability one of the sets that I think. Okay, look that. It has measure one because it's a finite intersection of, um, of measure one sets. Okay. And this thing here is not empty for the reasons that we saw before, right? Because like this larger set will in particular contain, um, contain this intersection here. Okay, this, this overlap between the two. Good. So now we, we have this fixed lambda. And remember that in print post selection paradoxes, we want to assign this function f of, uh, for every projector. And we just say, well, this is exactly the probability for a fixed lambda belonging to this intersection. And, you know, for, for P belonging in my original set, that thing is one, like we computed here, so it satisfies this CABL probabilities. Okay, so condition zero. 
f of p is, is the probability, the quantum probability of this. Okay. It's true for all p's in my original set. And then in this logical principle selections paradoxes, we kind of extended this set, right? And now we need to see what happens when we extend this function to that set. So, uh, so the first condition was that zero is smaller than f of p, smaller than one. But this now, uh, the principal selection fixed the lambda, okay? Fix this inter intersection, which means we pick any lambda from here. This is fixed. Okay, so now this, this probability, this is a, a normal probability distribution according to my model, so it must always be between zero and one. That's, that's easy. Then we needed that this, so this should be one and f of zero should be zero. And this comes directly from, again, assumptions on the, the non-contextual model, which is that Uh, if this PK sum up to a P of M, sorry, if this, if this EK sum up to a P of M, then the, the joint probability must be one for any ontic state. In particular, you can think of the P of M that's just the identity. Okay, so then there's, there's only one element here and this must be one. Okay, and then if you think of the P of M that's just the identity and nothing, then because um, this probability is one, the other one must be one minus one to zero. Yeah. And then we need to prove the last one. Which is uh, that if we have two projectors that commute, then we want that f of of q minus f of p q, and Again, we, we do this by considering a global measurement. We think, oh, let's think of the global measurement that is done by combining these two. So we have PQ, we have P1 minus Q, we have uh, 1 minus PQ, 1 minus P1 minus Q. Okay. And then from the assumption of non or measurement non-contextuality, we have that, well, since P is PQ plus P identity minus Q, then the probability of P given lambda is the probability of PQ given lambda, the probability of P Okay, we have this for P, we have the same for Q, we have the same for one minus P, one minus Q, right? Uh, this we saw before, so now we start from here. So we have this probability of P plus Q minus PQ. And now, nothing to do with the ontic model, we're just gonna rewrite this, this thing that's inside here. And this you can compute 
if you want, this is the same as identity minus 1 minus p, 1 minus q. Oh, and because it's, okay. This is an operator equality, which you can see that is true. Okay, now we just use this kind of properties of the ontic model. So this is 1 minus probability of 1 minus p, 1 minus q, lambda. And now we're just going to add and subtract something. So probability of p, 1 minus q. I subtracted this, now I add it again so that it's zero. Okay, so what do I have here? This sums up to the probability of, of one minus q, right? By, by using just this thing, but instead of having operator p here, you have one minus q because you have the same, and you have these two options on the other side. So this is 1 minus probability of 1 minus q, given lambda, plus probability of p, 1 minus q, given lambda. And I'll do the same trick again. So I add and subtract pq given lambda minus probability of pq given lambda. <laughs> ah, if only I had five centimeters more. And let's do it here. Oh, no, I don't like doing it here. Let's do it here. Sorry. I'll do it in a different color so you know which came first. Good. So we have one minus this is probability of one minus an operator, so it's one minus the probability of the operator. These two group together to give me just the probability of P given lambda. And that is still left over. Right. Good. Let's do cancel out. And now I got already my result. Good. So what does this tell me? So if I say, well, so it satisfies the three algebraic conditions, right? So if I say, okay, what's happening when you do pre and post selection? is that the, pre the, the preparation actually prepares one of these ontic states. And then if we want to talk about intermediate measurements that are compatible with the post-selection, we just need to think that we're still in this overlap of, of these two sets, right? And there's, an ontic, there's a, a model that we have, which is that, look, the probabilities are just given by uh, the probabilities by going this ontic state, right? Which is a nice kind of classical model. But if we have this, and this is true in my smaller set of projectors, then whenever I extend it to a larger set, to this p prime, it must always satisfy the, the algebraic conditions, right? Uh, which means that we cannot have a paradox by definition, right? So what could go wrong? So that, that's, that's the idea. So that's like the... The idea that if you have a logical PPS paradox, then we can't have a contextual model, a non-contextual model. So we have contextuality. So what could go wrong? Several things could go wrong. So maybe uh, you know it satisfies these things, but when I go to larger, to other projectors in my larger algebra, it does not satisfy the ABL probabilities. Uh, yeah, it doesn't satisfy 
the ABL probabilities for the large thing. So it, it's not a good model for the statistics of the experiment. Or it could be that we assume that this intermediate projective measurements update according to this update rule, that the, the map is given by that, but it's not, right? That could be the thing that, that fails. Or it could be one of the two assumptions, right, that we used, which was uh, this outcome determinism and the measurement on contextuality. So it could be that it's one of those two that fails. We don't know, right? We just have a theorem saying that, look, this model cannot correspond to, we cannot model, for example, Hardy's experiment via an uncontextual model. We cannot model uh, the pigeons or a three box experiment via an uncontextual model, right? But we, it's like Bell's theorem. We have all these assumptions. We know that at least they cannot all be true at the same time. We don't know which one. Okay. How much time do we have left? Is it five minutes or nine minutes? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, no, nine minutes is not enough. Huh. Uh, the question now is like, uh, why should you care, right? Does this tell us something deep about the world we live in? Uh, this assumption of non-contextuality looks very strong, the assumption of measurement uh, outcome determinism looked very strong as well, so maybe these are just not natural assumptions, right? And what I wanted to show you is how they can be derived by from something very simple. Maybe I start today and we continue tomorrow. Uh, and that's Leibniz principle of uh, uh, Rob says this more eloquently, but um, equivalence of things that cannot be distinguished. Meaning, like if I have if I have a duck and something that walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, we call it a duck as well. I'll I'll explain to you what this means. So so let's let's forget about quantum theory for a moment and think that we have just an operational theory. Meaning, you are thrown into a lab. You don't even know what kind of systems you're measuring uh, or what's going on. All you know is that you can push some buttons which uh, which corresponds to some description of a preparation. Prepar preparation. Okay. You can push some other buttons that give you correspond to measurements. Okay. So bef before this was the POVMs and these were the quantum states, but now just think in general that this is not the case, right? And just say that, uh, so each measurement has some set of outcomes, right? And we have some, you know, you're thrown in the lab, you spend some hours pressing buttons, uh, and eventually you collect enough statistics such that you create um, your a probability distribution from your statistics. Okay, given that I press some button for a given preparation, I press another button for a measurement, and I got outcome K. This give you these frequencies, okay? And the only thing that this needs to satisfy is that they're larger than zero, they're positive, and the sum over k for each measurement. Okay, this one. Okay. So this is your operational th theory. And I'll say, okay, here I am in my lab, maybe, maybe it's like not quantum systems, but plants or something, and I'm seeing what happens if I add more water or more sun, whatever. But I want to, to create a model of reality. And that's just what we saw before. Okay, this is going to be my set. 
with a collection of subsets, the sigma algebra, some measurement, and this ontic distribution such that, you know, this u In the discrete case, it just goes from elements of lambda, right? In the continuous case, you need to say it goes from some set, some set set. And to zero one and behaves like a measure, meaning that it takes some subset and takes some preparation and it gives us this. which is what before we called, we just put the u little here. Yeah. Okay. So before we had this for quantum states, now we can think of it for, for uh, things in general. And this last thing that goes from the set of measurements also to zero one, Sorry about the abuse of notation. Of course, it must take the outcome as well. And it gives you this probably of k, given that I did lambda and the m. Right. And this must satisfy again that the sum for k, k m. Okay. So what connects? this model to the to my theory is that this probe are the empirical distributions uh, uh, Why am I doing this to myself? <sighs> okay, it's just a model that explains these things. So what makes it non-contextual? And sorry if I'm taking uh, some time from later. One can distinguish two types of non-contextuality. One is preparation non-contextuality, and the other one is measurement. And again, think of the ducks. So preparation means that if I cannot distinguish two preparations, then they must be modeled in the same way in the, in the ontic model, in the ontological model. So, because so far this is completely general, right? Preparation context. This could be in, even like saying, oh, my model is just, you know, my ontic states are, uh, quantum states, for example. Preparation on contextuality means if the statistics are the same for two different distributions, like no measurement can distinguish between these two different distributions. So for, uh, for all M, then Uh, they must correspond to the same. They must correspond to the same um, to the same measure. Okay. Um, okay, which looks natural, right? But it, it, it's, unlike the assumptions, for example, in Belden locality, it's very easy to, um, to contradict because remember, look, <coughs> these are the measurements that are accessible to you in your lab, right? Just because I prepare two states and I cannot distinguish them through any measurement in the lab, it doesn't mean that there's not a better measurement that I don't have access to. 
that could distinguish them, right? So for example, even if I just um, imagine that these are preparations over two qubits, but the measurements only measure the first qubit, right? And there's lots of preparations that seem equivalent as long as the state of the first qubit is the same. But if I wanted a, a proper underlying model, I should, you know, a complete underlying model knowing quantum theory, they should not be the same distribution of ontic states, right? And measurement on contextuality is very similar. That's the one we've been working with. So measurement non-contextuality is the same. It's like, well, if I cannot distinguish these two measurements no matter what preparations I put inside this, right? Uh, sorry. P. Then the ontic distributions must be the same. So this is what happened, for example, in the quantum case that we saw before. These distributions here only depended on the P of M element, right? Because, again, for any preparation, the probability only depends on the P of M element if you're not thinking about post-selection later. Okay? So it did not depend on the larger context of the, of the measurement there. Again, looks very natural if we assume that we have enough variety of distributions to probe the whole um, the whole uh, measurement spectrum. So, for example, uh, no wait, that's an example for the other case. Uh, Yeah, that's an example, a counterexample for here that is not quantum at all. Like, so suppose that I'm preparing um, light of different colors, so P corresponds to different frequencies of light, uh, and my measurement is just looking at it and registering the color, right? But suppose that I'm colorblind, then I cannot distinguish, for example, two different colors, but I will still model them in the same way. Okay. Good. So uh, just generally, this. Okay, just from this assumption in the quantum case, you can get outcome determinism for free. Okay. And yeah, this is where it comes from. It's from this idea that if two things cannot be distinguished, then why should we model them differently uh, in our model of reality? And turns out, if we stick to this, then you know, we end up with a model that is not compatible with quantum theory. Okay. So quantum theory does not satisfy these two things. Good. There was, before I let you go, there's something we have to talk about the exam, which is uh, a solution to a problem we created. So, uh, normally we allow students to bring a cheat sheet, right? But we forgot to write this when we submitted the course information to EDOS, so it's not there, which means, and we cannot change this halfway through the semester. So you cannot bring your individual cheat sheets. Okay, but uh, one way around this is if you collectively create a, a cheat sheet of one page, then we add it to the exam. Okay, so uh, in a week or so, tell us a way that you're going to provide this. We just need to have it like a week before the exam. Okay, one page A4, it can be it can be typed. Don't care, and then we just add it as an extra page of the exam that we print. Okay. <laughs> So you're technically not bringing individual information, but it's just there. And we'll publish it, we'll publish it on, on Moodle as well, right? So your job is to find a way to coordinate this and give me a delegate or some Dropbox or somewhere where, where we can check this. Okay. All right. So thank you. And tomorrow, I think, we'll talk about weak measurements. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Nuria, do you know when you want to start? Sorry about that.
All right. Well, all right, bye.